the specialist of uh, many aspects of regravitational lensing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so he uh, has uh, responsibilities in Euclid, in the Euclid mission, and before that he was involved, and you are involved in KIT also. I suspect most of your talk will be de dedicated to the KIT uh, results. But also, uh, Hank has had a large contribution to the CFHT lens results as well, and the uh, early stages of uh, cosmic shear measurements in, on CFHT, from CFHT data, and even early on, early on with uh, HST during mm -hmm. your PhD, right? Yeah. PhD you did with uh, Conrad Kirken in Leiden back in 2000. So in Groningen. Is it, huh? in Groningen. In Groningen. Oh, in yeah. Groningen. Okay. And uh, well. I think that's it, you. So let's uh, listen to you. Uh, Good, thanks. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here, and it's, of course, difficult to perhaps tell you something new about weak lensing by large scale structure. Because here in, in, at EAP, uh, people, Yanni Meyer and various other people have made important contributions. But I'll, I'll talk a bit about mostly the work we've been doing so far. Um, just to get everybody on the same page, right? This is the question uh, that we're trying to, to, to answer, like who ordered this, right? So this is really the, uh, a big problem in physics. Um, and in particular, like what, what is this, what could this dark energy be? Um, and I think when we look at the dark universe, right? So what is dark matter? We don't know. But at least we have some ideas also from theory. There are some ideas what it could be. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's awkward. Um, it's definitely not what we're used to. Um, but we do have some observational constraints. We now know, especially from the CMB, that it must be non-baryonic. Um, and that it's a relatively heavy particle. Right? So it can't be neutrinos. So neutrinos are dark matter, but they are not the dark matter. And I think what is very exciting is that like, some, someone will discover something. Right? We're guaranteed a discovery. We just don't know exactly what, but we do need new physics. I think that is very exciting. So dark energy, the situation is a bit more complicated because I think to date there has been no idea that is, that is really plausible. Right? There's, there's various ways, but there's always clear objections, so there's assumptions, we could say, well, maybe some anthropic arguments, but in a way that's throwing the towel in the ring, although it could be correct, of course. All right, so that's the question, is it a cosmological constant, which then drives you in a certain direction, or is it some new dynamic field? Uh, could it be a problem with general relativity? So we don't really have theoretical guidance here, um, and in, that, in the absence of the theoretical guidance, I think the only way we can do is get better observations. So basically, that's um, what I set out to do. And if you've been in the Netherlands, there's always these, these old tiles with pieces of wisdom. Um, this one, I sort of, this quote I found somewhere, but it, it really resonated with me because that's basically what the problem is. Right? The hardest thing of all is to find a black cat in a dark room. I think we can all agree on that especially if there is no cat. And that's a little bit the problem on the experimental side, because you can design a measurement. So for instance, I can do a supernova survey, and I can measure certain aspects of dark energy, but I'm completely blind to the modified gravity. And so I have to be careful that when I design the experiment, I leave as many options open, I probably can't leave all options open, but as many options open as we can. So we should look at what kind of things can we measure if we want to learn more about dark energy. Well, I guess one important lesson from history is that it's not an obvious effect. There's a reason why dark energy was discovered only 20 years ago. Right? Its effects on the observable properties of the universe, right, they may appear obvious now with these very nice measurements from Planck, from supernovae, etc., from BEO. Right? But they're still extremely subtle effects. Like this is why it took so long to realize this. So we need to measure things reliably, very precisely, very reliably. Um, and the two things that we know it's, that gives some signal is the cosmic expansion history, basically what the supernovae measured. Right? They looked at how the universe expands. And that's usually characterized by this dark energy equation of state, this, this W as a function of T. 
But we can also look at the cosmic history of structure formation, which then folds in effectively the, the attractive effects of gravity and, and that we can quantify by the growth rate of structure. And both of these give us different views of, of what is happening. Right, so the, the supernova results, of course, also in France with the other part of the CFC Legacy Survey, SNLS, um, has made incredible progress. So this is not even progress in the last 20 years, but I think it's most of the, these were the really big surveys. But it really shows from basically that first uh, indication of dark energy how good the measurements on the supernova have become. But ultimately, they're limited in, in what you can constrain, right? There's basically degenerate solutions, especially when you look at modified gravity, right? So when people have their new modified gravity theory, the first thing they do is fit this, but that's not enough. I think that is very important, too. So people say, oh, I have a new theory. It fits the supernova data. Well, sure, that's what it should do. Otherwise, you should just throw it away right away. But you should then ask, does it fit measurements of the growth of structure? Right? And we, can, we know from cosmological simulations that when we look at, if we change the cosmological parameters, this is sort of a similar setup, but one with a cosmological constant, the other one without, that as you evolve those in a computer, the, the structure at, at one redshift may look similar, but it will look different at other redshift, because basically the balance between the pool of gravity and the sort of expansion, that the, 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 the push out by dark energy, that balance changes over time, and that is shown in the, in the large-scale structure. Um, so if we can do that, we can basically test both the underlying cosmology and test gravity. So, but there's many probes. Um, and so, so, so how can we probe this matter distribution? Because the real problem, of course, is that it's mostly invisible, and it's difficult to look at invisible things. So people have, of course, looked at the clustering of galaxies which are basically the, the, yeah, the sprinkles on top of this dark matter distribution, or the clusters of galaxies, which are the peaks in this distribution, but they're so well identified that you can actually get their individual masses, because that turns out to be the important thing. There's two parts in the cosmology, is, is the patterns that you can measure, and then barren acoustic oscillations are an example of that, which are quite stable to details of, of baryon physics, and then using the amplitude itself, and so with clusters, you might think of, if you can measure their masses, to use the amplitude of these peaks, um, although there's still the issue of how to select them. Right, and especially when you look at galaxies, I think this is, uh, although the real universe is a bit kinder to us, it's good to remind you that although the distribution of galaxies traces the dark matter distribution very well, and so patterns are preserved, you have to be careful about the amplitude because they can be biased. So for instance, if we fly over Earth, we see that if we fly over the US, little dots, and we know there's cities, so there's people living there, and the brighter the dot, the more people live there. And that's generally quite true. Um, if we then continue flying over Asia, we see the same. So we see the bright dots, and where there's bright dots, there's more people. But if you compare the amount of light, it's clear that most people live in the US. Well, we know that's not quite true because there's underlying factors such as wealth that drive the amount of light. And the same could happen in galaxies. In reality, galaxy formation, although complex, is not that extreme. So the amount of stars does, or the amount of starlight does depend on other properties, but it does correlate relatively well um, uh, with the amount of dark matter. So the variations are not enormous. Right? But the features might still be fine. So this is why BEO is a very powerful probe of the cosmology. But again, it measures a specific aspect. So now, after, so now we can focus on, of course, the technique that, that should solve it all. Um, and that's gravitational lensing. So basically, it uses the fact that density fluctuations change space-time, basically cause uh, variation, a, a sort of tidal distortion and it can cause image splitting, but in general we'll focus on basically the overall distortion of, of that field. And basically what it does is that um, it leads to correlations in the shapes of galaxies. So that's uh, a picture actually a long time ago made by Yannick Maillet. Right, in these inner regions 
a simulated picture, you see this strong lensing. So there, the stretching, this tidal effect is so large that it doesn't matter what the galaxy looked like initially. So there you get a very precise measurement because the, it doesn't matter what the galaxy looked like. Whereas in the outer regions, it all looks very noisy. There's many galaxies, they seem to be pointing in random directions. And that's because galaxies have their own intrinsic shapes. Now, they might be slightly aligned. Uh, that's something we're investigating. It's not very important for today. Um, but if they're not, then they look more as random. But this lensing signal causes slight orientation, or basically changes in their preferred uh, angle or their major axis. And so once we combine them all together, we do find that although this looks pretty random, on average, these galaxies tend to align tangentially with this gradient in the, in the gravitational potential. It's just every galaxy itself is extremely noisy. These, these changes in shape are of the order of 1%, whereas the intrinsic shapes of the galaxies have elliptices of about 30%. But if we average enough galaxies, we can map that tidal, basically these net alignments, this tidal field, and construct uh, an image of the dark matter distribution. And, and of course, You've all seen the bullet cluster image where in blue you see the dark matter distribution, um, which uh, follows the light distribution very nicely, whereas the hot gas is sort of fallen behind. And so basically it tells us that dark matter must be pretty collisionless. And here's another case of a very puzzling system, Abel 520, where we actually seem to be finding a blob of dark matter without any galaxies, which we uh, still don't know what to make of. Um, but what is is very powerful for clusters um, because it provides us with a way to measure their masses even when they're dynamically clearly very, very complex. Um, I think even Gary will have a hard time modeling this through dynamics. Where is the dark matter? Here, it's actually interesting. That it's around here where the peak in the X-rays is. And as we had, so this is the ground-based data. It wasn't that significant, but with better, better HST data, it just became more and more significant. So we're not quite sure. I think there's still a bit of a question, what is the proper statistics to use? Like whether if you just draw enough circles, whether in clusters you, you have some Poisson noise. So I think that is the only way sort of out, but otherwise it's still a very puzzling result. All right, so but basically I want to focus on the shape correlations um, because as these, these light rays of different galaxies that initially are random on the sky, they, they, they basically, as they probe through the universe, they feel this common tidal field. And this is why, by the time we observe them, uh, we see a net alignment in these shapes. And we can use these statistics to directly infer the statistics of the underlying density field. So this is why it's so powerful, because we immediately measure the statistics of the matter distribution. Right, so that is direct. Now, it's a little bit more complex because the matter distribution, and I'll get to that, is not the same as the dark matter distribution. Um, and if we do this by effectively slicing the universe in bits by say, we'll only look at the high redshift galaxies and we compare the result to the just low redshift galaxies and things in between, we can essentially, you could sort of visualize this as if we're making mass reconstruction. So at low redshift, so galaxies only here, sources only here, see the low redshift universe, so we can make a picture of the low redshift mass distribution. Over here, as lensing is a cumulative effect, these sources here see intermediate redshift and low redshift, but because we figured out what the low redshift image looked like, we can sort of subtract it off. And so we can build up a 3D map of the dark matter distribution in the universe. Crudely speaking, it's not quite what we do, but, but conceptually, that is what is happening. And so for that, we need relatively good redshift information. It doesn't need to be spectroscopy, but photometric redshifts are good enough, but we do need to get the mean distribution quite right. So, they, so individual galaxies don't need to be very precise, but the overall population, their, their redshift distribution need to be known very accurately. I then, that brings me to the usual thing, there's a difference between precision and accuracy. Right? Precision cosmology is super easy. It basically tells you, you've got a big survey. But what people want to do, at least I want to do, is also accurate cosmology. So precision says something about the error bar, accuracy says something about how meaningful the measurement is. 
And so I already said, well, we need good shapes. Uh, we need photometric redshift that are accurate. But also, the signal itself, we need to correctly interpret. And so if you look at the complications, like observation distortions from the point spread function, they're typically larger than the signal. Galaxies are pretty faint, so getting spectroscopy to really calibrate this can be a bit of a pain, although it's getting pretty good these days. And of course, the lensing signal itself is mostly if you want to look at sort of what kind of mass scale. The galaxy groups is roughly where the signal peaks. And so that's highly nonlinear scales where a lot of the signal, signal to noise is. So on the shapes, that's something, uh, uh, well, we've been working on for a very, very long time. Um, basically, the images are corrupted by the point spread function. And it, that's even the case when you're in space. Um, but for the ground-based data, it's obvious, right, the, the blurring. But we can sort of forward model the process. We know exactly what happens in the process. It's, it's well understood. Although I've lately been uh, focusing a bit more on this bit. So this step actually can be the pixelization or actually reading out the camera can cause some complications, which is, I think now as, as we're getting better data, we're starting to look into those kind of details. Um, and so based in principle, you can simulate the process. And, and if you have an algorithm that you want to apply to data, you can sort of say how well, how biased is it? You can calibrate your algorithms. Um, but it's important, and that has become recently clear, that it's then important that the simulations match the data statistically. So it's sort of emulation is, is basically what we're doing now. Um, and that's because there's also selection effects. So the whole process is rather nonlinear, rather complex. But basically, current state-of-the-art methods are getting sort of at the level of 1%. So when you sort of say, OK, if I measure cluster masses, the lensing side of that, we can do to 1%. There's other aspects like deep projections, et cetera, which are, more, are different. But the overall lensing bit is, is largely solved for current set of data. So that then allows us to do cosmology. And, and so this is basically what I'll want to talk about. So this cosmic shear, so this overall, can we constrain cosmological parameters with uh, gravitational lensing? So there's a paper by uh, Martin Kilbinger um, where we added the point. I'll be talking about this kid's point. Uh, you see over time that error bars have s sort of shrunk, but not really a lot. And that is that even though the precision improved, we also uncovered new systematics, and they basically sort of kept uh, thing in check. So I think those measurements, in a way, are very optimistic, but remarkably, the, they are also still very consistent. So it seems that, on average at least, all the systematics we've uncovered sometimes move things up and sometimes move things down. And so that it's really sort of random. Anywhere in the process, things happen. Um, and in gray is the Planck results, which I'll get to in the end. But you'll notice that they're a little bit below. And so I use this parameter because lensing essentially measures how much stuff fluctuates in the universe to first order. So I can have a little bit of matter, low omega matter, fluctuating a lot. So that's a high sigma 8. That's the RMS. Or I can have big chunks of matter just fluctuating a little bit. And that gives me the same RMS. And that's essentially what we're measuring, crudely speaking. Uh, of course, we want to do more, but that's where we are today. So this project kits, um, so you may have heard of it, but it's a, a sort of an upgrade for us from, from C of HC lens. It, uh, PI is Kunkaiken in Leiden, so it's, it's 10 times large. It's 1,500 square degrees. It's not quite as deep as legacy survey. Um, but it does have the same kind of image quality, very nice PSF, very well-behaved point spread function. It's not quite circular, but it's, it's, it's constant across the field of view. And what is important, we have uh, five bands with Vista and the infrared. So we get nine bands of photometry, which really helps us with the photometric redshift. So that's really quite useful. Right, so under the right angle, the VLT survey telescope or VST, which doesn't stand for Very Small Telescope, uh, next to the VLTs. Um, so it almost looks the same size, but this is a two and a half meter telescope, so it's quite a bit smaller. This is our workhorse instrument, Omega Cam. Um, it essentially looks like Mega Cam on CFHD. Um, and so it's a large group of people, which changes all the time, but I probably should update this, but 
it's, it's too much work to keep this up to date all the time. But the main places are Leiden, uh, Edinburgh, and, and Bonn on the lensing side. So there's also people on additional science with kids in, in Groningen and Naples in particular. But there's people elsewhere as well. And so just to talk a little bit not only about the cosmology, but also other things you can do with this data. Um, so actually our early science results, we focus a lot on a particular area of the survey. So we prioritize the overlap with gamma, which is a large redshift survey, and that allowed us to study very interesting things like galaxy groups, uh, satellite galaxies, because they're very good spectroscopy, central galaxies, and also environmental dependencies, and actually some of the recent work actually, we start to expand a little bit, but we're looking at things like voids, uh, lensing of, of, of sort of filamentary structures, of, of troughs, um, so we've started to do many more things and really take advantage of the overlap with spectroscopy, which really helps us to identify lenses and study those galaxies themselves. And in particular, I find the galaxy groups very interesting, and the reason for that is because we studied a while back the impact of, of feedback. So as I said, um, the lensing signal is sort of dominated on the galaxy group scale, and groups are sort of well, uh, that's a bit nasty in a way, because groups are sufficiently massive and common, so that's why they dominate the lensing signal. But at the same time, their gravitational potential or their gravitational binding energy is quite comparable to the energy output of AGN. And so that means that AGN have quite the impact there. So this is, in clusters, the basically AGN yeah, does its stuff, but it, really do it doesn't really change the galaxy clusters but it does change the mass distribution in groups. And that's shown here in simulation by uh, Amandie Lebrun, where you look at changes in, it is the Eagle code, but changing the, the AGN properties. And you really see that at the high mass end, well, things change, of course, a little bit because that's because progenitors has changed. But overall, you see that these clusters more or less get similar, even though you change the feedback, the observable properties are similar. But once you hit this group scale, if you tune up the AGN power, things really change. And what is happening is you're blowing out gas, so essentially taking out some of the matter that, that if there's no feedback, is nicely following the dark matter, but you're actually redistributing over a larger area of space. And if you then think in terms of power spectra, that means you're randomizing some of the material and you're suppressing the power on that scale. And that's what lensing is sensitive to. So if you look at power spectra, that's sort of what I just said. So at, at small scales, baryons cool and form galaxies, stars. So they get a very big spike in the power spectrum. So that's you shoot up here. And then on large scale, things are sort of average. But it's on this intermediate scale, it matters whether you're pushing the gas out to larger scales and essentially like smoothing the mass distribution. And AGN do that particularly uh, well, and so if the mass distribution is smooth and we interpret the analysis based on dark matter only simulations where we implicitly assume that the dark matter and the baryons trace each other, we end up with biased results. And in particular, if we want to do this in the Euclid era, we would get completely wrong cosmologies. So we really need to study this baryon physics uh, quite well, so you can try to account for this. And so as I said, we, we, we focused the overlap with gamma. So these are the kids' areas, and these boxes here are where gamma has spectroscopic redshifts, about uh, 200,000, and they, they are extremely complete. So it's a very nice redshift survey for this. Um, so we don't quite overlap with them, but it's in the end about 200 square degrees of overlap with kids. Um, and so, as I said, they're very complete, and, and what is nice, because of that completeness, they have a very nice group catalog. Right? And, and, and Gary remembers when I did my thesis, when I had maybe 30 galaxy groups, and that was the best we had. Now we have thousands of galaxy groups, and so the signal looks a lot better than uh, what I did for my thesis. Now this sort of is a redshift cone from, from gamma, and you can sort of see the structure quite well. And this is also why looking at things like environment is, is quite nice with this, with this data. And so this is sort of graphically showing them what we can do, because we have the kids' images, and gamma tells us, okay, here's a galaxy group, and it tells us 
which galaxies belong to the group, which especially with groups is, is quite tricky because you don't have good membership otherwise. Um, and so we can get stellar masses, luminosities of those galaxies. We can look, combine with Planck measurements of the SZ. Uh, there's also follow up with SPT and ACT nowadays, um, but uh, this is a, picked a fairly massive one, so you can actually see it in the SZ. Um, you can look at the X-ray. Um, and of course, from weak lensing, we can reconstruct essentially the mass distribution of, of in this case, it's a more like a cluster. But you, we have all this data, and so the lensing measurement eventually, we look at the mean alignment, tangential alignment as a function of distance from what we think is a central galaxy, and that allows us to measure the masses. Right? And, and compared to my thesis work, this is orders of magnitude better. We now really get significant detections over a quite wide range in luminosities. So this is in a paper by Massimo Viola. And so there we looked at in the scaling relation. We can look at how does the, the mass of the halo scale with the luminosity of the group. And we can look at also all the measurements with SDSS. Or here are some old CNOC measurements that basically were done post after my thesis. But you can compare these measurements. You can look at the mass to light ratio, function of luminosity. And of course, this can be then used to look at hydro simulators to say, are you doing a good job? And there we run into a problem because the way people running the simulations and look at their data, right, they look in theory space. They know the mass of a cluster. Right? They don't need to go out and measure things. And so they tend to prop things in mass versus some other quantity. And that's very inconvenient because we can't measure this. So when we plot our measurements on top of this, we tend to smooth things around. So what would have been better is a plot of mass to light ratio versus the luminosity of the BCG or some other combination. Because then we would have had systems of different mass at different scales. Because these are observationally a whole range in mass. And because we don't know this direction, we can't tell the difference. So for instance, we know that the ref simulation is not good because we see groups that exist. But that's a strange way to, to look at this. Because what we would like to do is have, these are our measurements, to have predictions that we can compare to these measurements without scrambling the, the, the simulations around. And so that's what we started to do now a little bit more. So really um, talk to the simulators and, and sometimes do stuff ourselves. Uh, very nice simulation is Bahamas that Ian McCarthy has been doing. It's essentially the Eagle setup, but a larger volume, so they tune things a little bit. And it's adjusted such that it gets the mass function and x-ray properties quite right. And with uh, Arthur Jacobs, a former master student, um, we submitted this paper where we basically look at the galaxy lensing signal in the groups that we have, which are the black points here. And then we look at the Bahamas prediction for the same stellar masses, and we find so that's the red curve, and that agrees remarkably well. Now, perhaps maybe not that remarkably because they got the stellar mass function right, but it basically tells us they also got more or less the right relation between stellar mass and halo mass overall. Um, it's very good agreement. Also interesting in the, in the um, X-ray scaling relation. So that's sort of what we want to then use to constrain which of these feedback models matches the data. Because from lensing, we can set the mass scale observationally, and we can do this comparison. And that's sort of the idea that when we do the cosmology and we have to account for these variants, we want to use the observations to sort of put a prior on these parameters. And together with uh, Stein de Bakker uh, and Joop Scheer, so Stein is a PhD student, and with Joop Scheer, we're looking at actually X-ray observations and how they can already help constrain some of the, the parameter ranges. And the idea ultimately is to sort of do a joint analysis where you look at scaling relations of groups, clusters, and the cosmic shear to, do, to basically constrain the baryon physics and the cosmology at the same time. All right, so then looking at back at, at the cosmology, so these are, right, so that was sort of the, the sidetrack, but it, it's sort of, I think, um, a nice additional thing where lensing can be quite important. The same, of course, I won't talk about it, is how it calibrates cluster masses for cosmology as well. Um, 
I'm not sure that was more enough for, for Henry, but, um, but go back to cosmic shear. So basically, all these patches, we can make a mass reconstruction, and, and there's a few papers that actually look at the, 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 the statistics of these peaks in the mass distribution and, and try to do cosmology with that. And it's quite complementary to the sort of higher order statistics um, with what we're getting from basically the two, these correlations in the galaxy shapes. The current analysis of what I'll talk about focuses on 450 square degrees um, that we analyzed. Now, as Raphael already mentioned, C of HD uh, LS. Um, and since then, we've, like, even then, we learned a lot of, of things that, and that's why it took actually quite some time to, to really publish that result. Um, but since then, we, we corrected many more things. So we now, for instance, because we now realize how important sort of the, these image simulations are and how well they need to be matched to the data, um, we now use a better calibration of the shape measurement method. Um, and that's something we're continuously improving. This, every step, we learn more things. Um, also, a better calibration of the source residue distribution. Here we have one advantage that as I said, KITS is not as deep as C of HDLS, and that helps us because most spectroscopic surveys do reach more or less the depth of KITS. And so that's, and, and one particular thing that is going on right now is actually targeting some of these surveys so we can calibrate uh, using as many uh, spectroscopic redshifts as we can. Um, as I said, I was not going to talk about these intrinsic alignments, but you do need to start taking them into account for these kind of surveys. So the fact that galaxies by themselves uh, feel each other, in particular, they might point, so satellites might point to a massive galaxy that causes a lensing signal, and we need to model these effects. So this has been studied quite well in SDSS, and so we have to also, we're also working on a survey together with people in Spain and the UK, PowCam survey, where we use 40 narrowband uh, observations in the optical to get near spectroscopic redshifts for areas in C of HDLS, so where we have the shapes already, and so they that very good redshift information of down to magnitude 22 and a half or so of, of 0 0.0035, which is good enough to really see which which are in in a particular structure, we can map this intrinsic alignment signal. So that will improve, but already with current measurements, we can sort of marginalize over the uncertainties. Uh, as I mentioned, this baryon physics is very important. And also the errors themselves, the covariance matrix. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that, because uh, even that has improved since our previous improvement. Um, so this is really the raw signal. So we have four of these tomographic bins. And then we can look also at cross correlations between these tomographic bins. So the autocorrelations you see here, and then basically, because we're measuring two, like we either measure an ellipticity and a position angle, or we can combine them in a slightly different way, we're measuring two correlation functions. This is psi plus and psi minus. So one measures sort of the correlations like this, and the other one sort of uh, correlations like, uh, what is it, like this. So that's both of them uh, combined so in a way, you can combine them into something that, that is only sensitive to cosmology, the other one to systematics as well, and that looks also consistent. But this is sort of the raw measurements we fit to. Now, and then it's also very important then how you then start to interpret these data, right? Because you, right, we're well known in the literature that, that there's something called confirmation bias, or perhaps if you don't like somebody, defamation bias, right? You can also decide, I'm not going to agree with that person. Um, but it's very important to do these analysis blindly. So we basically, what we did is we create three catalogs where the signal has been changed a little bit, done by an external blinder, in our case, Matthias Bartelmann. Um, and so we analyzed all these sets separately. So this is blind one. And uh, so basically you see that Mostly we measure this, this, genetic, this combination of sigma-8, this amplitude of fluctuation, matter density in a sort of degenerate way. So that's why we use this S8, this combination which sort of measures, this is what we measure really well with our data. Um, and so this is our measurement for blind one. Here's the Planck measurement. Um, and if you look at the phase value values, this has some tension with Planck, but 
Who cares, right? This is just blind number one. Blind number two, 2.8 sigma. Okay, well, that could happen too, right? Um, let's look at blind number three, ah, well, 1.7 sigma. So when Kuhn Kuiken showed this first at the Euclid Consortium meeting in Lisbon, most people voted for this one because he asked for some audience participation and the audience voted this one to be preferred, which is a nice confirmation of confirmation bias. Uh, because this is actually the correct blind, um, unless our external blinder has been playing us, but we actually do check uh, which one is the correct one after the fact. And so this is basically where we are right now. So there's a slight discrepancy, if you want to call that, right? But it, I think it's, it's a difference that is interesting enough to warrant further study. Um, and, and so most of this, or a significant fraction, is the systematic. So this is really mostly statistical, we think. Um, although, perhaps as we dig in a bit more, this might be a little bit larger than that. And it's largely related to the photo Z. So let me, um, so we're doing a lot of work on, on upgrading things. But of course, there's also another project called Dark Energy Survey that um, published some results. Um, in the meantime, while they're reviewing their paper, they're rewriting their own history by writing a paper where they fix something which then automatically gets fixed in their actual accepted paper. Um, and that's on... No, we, we published ours and then changed things. <laughs> so they, they are changing the analysis after submission. Um, although they document it, that's all fine. Um, but it's... Um, striking that in this particular paper that appeared last week, which is otherwise a nice paper, they focus on kids, but they fix the same problem for themselves, except they refer to a paper where this problem no longer exists. Um, so the survey geometry matters when you do the covariance matrix. So to compute things quickly, we use the, a sort of analytic estimate, but this kids area is rather complicated, has a lot of boundaries, and so at large scales, we didn't quite get the right number of pairs. Now, we had discovered this ourselves, and our, the, the updates we're doing right now, we had fixed this already. Um, but that paper showed very nicely that that improved because both surveys had a rather poor chi-squared. And once you fix the covariance actually to its correct values, you actually count the number of pairs directly. And the chi-squares are very good. Uh, they did point out also an... an essentially an error in the way we uh, propagated some of these multiplicative bias uncertainties in our covariance matrix. So that shifted our result a little bit. And there's another correction we already had documented. And so the net result is that the kids' results, compared to what I showed just previously, have moved up by a little bit, by this much. And, and theirs actually has moved down a little bit, but that they don't show because the paper they refer to has been updated already. Um, but I think what is the upshot is, is this remarkably good agreement between these two measurements. And they're completely independent, right? They have different shape measurement algorithm, different data, different telescope, different uh, filters, et cetera, different depths. Um, so you could just almost by eye combine these two, and you notice that both of them are still below the Planck value, right? But on their own, they're, they're now more consistent. So I think it's really open what is happening here. But I think that the positive thing is this very good agreement between these two surveys. Um, so as I said, the current results are interesting. But of course, you, you want to do better. You want smaller error bars to see what is going on. Um, so we're improving constraints by improving using now folding in the infrared data. So that gives us much better tomographic bins. So they're, they're just better bins. And we're adding a fifth high redshift bin. And we can do that because we now have a better redshift calibration. And we're about to start the analysis of 1,000 square degrees of the survey. And in the process, we also, as I said, we, we fix the covariance matrix. There's a whole slew of other things. Also, the simulations themselves get better. Um, and so we expect that once we go to 1,000 square degrees, even though we only double the area, we should shrink the error bars by a factor of two, because that high redshift bin actually adds a lot of cosmology. And of course, we can do more than just cosmic shear. So there's a, a preliminary paper already by Adolf van Eutert combining galaxy clustering from, from gamma, because that's, they have a nice redshift survey. They have very good clustering measurements and galaxy galaxy lensing. And that's this, this green. So you basically have the old cosmic shear results. This is 
galaxy clustering and galaxy lensing, and you see that it's all consistent with one another, and that's the problem with just two sigma, right? So things are all consistent, and, and so move around by one sigma up, down, uh, left, right, and so really the message is we need more data. And well, if things go well, we will get more data in about four years, um, because this is unfortunately my future, although it's also very exciting to work on such a project. Um, so Euclid really is the next stage, right? It's designed to do lensing, um, but with that comes also a lot of headaches. There's a lot of things we are uncovering now with these new surveys, with the ongoing surveys, we have to do much, much, much better than. Um, still, it, it's really going to be phenomenal. Um, just to end this with a little bit of, just to impress you, although probably this audience should by now be brainwashed about the virtues of Euclid, right? This is a single Hubble exposure, right? And it's really nice data. The Euclid data will be more or less comparable in quality, a little bit worse, um, but quite comparable. Um, but the camera is just too small for Hubble. This is a single Euclid vis image. This is this Hubble image. So that just gives you graphically how much more data we're going to get because this image is only 1 60,000th of the survey. Right? So it's a really large area of the survey, a third of the sky. And I think we can't imagine all the stuff we'll be doing with these data. Right? So we'll focus on the, on the cosmic shear, but there's Already we know phenomenal strong lensing, but there will be tons of other things. Also the infrared survey that, that, that accompanies the optical imaging, it's going to be a phenomenal data set. Um, so you have to start somewhere, so that's why we do the lensing. Um, and so when we then look at sort of what we could do on, on the cosmology side, we're really pushing to the percent, sub-percent precision on these dark energy parameters. So that's something with the current generation surveys we can't really do. Right, so we really need to push to that boundary to, to really say, well, now we can start, well, there could be some strange dark energy model that really deviates from minus one, but I think realistically, whatever strange dark energy or different from a cosmological constant model there is, it will be fairly, fairly close to minus one. And so that's why we need this kind of precision. Or, of course, if we want to test modified gravity, although with the gravitational wave measurements, that's become uh, well, heavily constrained, but still we, we can get very nice uh, additional constraints. So that's where I wanted to end. So we've made tremendous progress um, in the last over, well, 20 years or so. Right? When I finished my thesis, nobody believed that you could do this kind of <coughs> cosmic shear measurements. Well, maybe Nick believed it, but um, maybe only Nick is the, like many people still don't believe it, but at least they're giving us a ton of money to try. Um, so that's good. Um, but it really has changed, right? If you look at cluster cosmology, all these cluster surveys are now calibrated using weak gravitational lensing. And so we keep pushing forward, yeah, and covering more and more things to solve. But so far, we've solved all the problems. Right? Because we just understand the detectors better. In a way, it's a very simple, it's a complex, but ultimately also somewhat simple physics that we, that we need to solve. It's just a lot of different pieces. We just need to get them all right. But it's manageable with enough calibration. Um, and so, so far, yeah, it's complex. And we need to keep on improving things, both on the observational side, but also the astrophysical biases. But again, these surveys also start to inform each other. So the KITS results already give an indication how the survey data themselves can help us constrain some of these barren physics or intrinsic alignment measurements. So I'd say still remain optimistic, and no showstopper has been found so far. And I've tried. <laughs> Thanks. Questions? With which um, one? I guess the question you really have to ask, you said in the past people were pessimistic. Um, 
how certain are you we're going to reach the precision required in shape measurement to make a meaningful constraint on cosmological parameters with Euclid, given the fact also that no other experiment, uh, there will be no possibility to have an independent measurement uh, in the time of Euclid like we can do now with uh, DES and kids. In fact, there won't be other, any other survey with the same uh, imaging data. Uh, so just make some comments about uh, shape measurement biases and how confident you are that we'll be able to resolve all of the uh, outstanding problems. Yeah, so I can't guarantee anything, but let me put it like this, although past uh, performance is no guarantee for the future, but so far we've always managed to solve this. And if I look at the problems that we're uncovering, they are now sort of at the 10 to the minus four level in, in, in multiplicative biases. There are some open issues now that we sort of, so it's, it's a bit of back and forth. So, Sometimes I'm very optimistic, then I discover something new, and then I get more pessimistic until we solve it. Um, the key here is calibration. And, and, so it's, and, and I think that is also, if I look at Euclid compared to, say, legacy survey, like, geez, what, we were very naive. At, and even when I was involved in SNAP, I think that was very naive, given what we know now. Um, so I think what is important is also what we've learned from DES and, and uh, KITS. So that's the synergy between those surveys and Euclid has been phenomenal. Also things, because for Euclid we had to think very hard. That we, um, but, but things get characterized much better. So, but yeah, I can't guarantee, but it becomes progressively difficult. So, so yeah, we might not achieve the ultimate precision on the other hand, a lot of the assumptions we've made so far, at least for Euclid performance, have been relatively conservative. So if I look at, at CTI, many of the detector effects, they, like we should correct them as well as we can, but, but a lot of them uh, don't impact the cosmology so much. So it's more, then it depends, if it's lambda CDM, then it's all fine, but if, we, if it's something weirder, then it becomes less clear what the impact of such a deviation would be. But I'm still optimistic. So otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> yeah, uh, along that, uh, short question about, you, you mentioned the intrinsic alignment as an improvement from different generation of surveys. Can you comment a bit more on that? Yeah, so most constraints now come essentially from SDSS, um, where that's red galaxies. Um, but there's also more work on, on the theory of intrinsic alignments, which suggests that at least red galaxies follow this, this linear alignment model or the nonlinear linear alignment model. Um, so that, that seems to behave relatively well. And it's still at the level, it's constrained sufficiently well, although we're now marginalizing over this, that it really doesn't impact the measurement so much. But for Euclid, you need to do this much, much better. Right? So, so as the surveys go, improve, you have to do better measurements. Um, gamma, so the, 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 what we did with, so there's actually, we're working on a paper, it's nearly done, is using these gamma measurements to constrain intrinsic alignment signal on, on smaller scales. And it suggests that there's hardly any signal. And also hydro simulations indicate that the notion that, so you have the red galaxies that have more or less a linear alignment model and the rest um, less strong. Um, but I think the interesting question, that's what we think of using this Pauken data, is to actually tie it more because people, as a sort of, so this is coming from the cosmic shear side. There's a whole history of people studying alignments of galaxies and, and, and torquing of galaxies from the galaxy evolution, of galaxy formation side, where they find in, in simulations very strong connections to filaments. And I think that's actually a very interesting direction to see if those are the better way to constrain the alignment models because we then project them. But we're now getting the data, the Paucom data in particular, we can actually trace filaments really, really nicely because we're getting sort of spectroscopic redshift quality over going faint enough to sort of really have a decent volume and then start looking at alignments. People have done this already with Viper, so sort of identify and there's also a recent paper with SDSS where they make filaments and then look at how galaxies align with filaments and that seems to give actually, like it's not overwhelming signal, but it starts to give signals and they might be a nice way to test this. And then once we build up a consistent model there, um, 
yeah, that's a problem we, we kind of deal with. I had another question actually. Uh, it's about which scale actually you, I mean, important for the constraint you, you put on, on Omega Matter and so on. So which our, scale are actually probe nowadays? Well, so the, the signal to noise always peaks roughly at the group scale, where we go out to sort of um, sort of half a degree or so. So, but but at very large scales, there's hardly any cosmic shear signal. So the signal to noise is is low there, especially with the current surveys. Also, so that's now especially with the new covariance matrix that really blew up our error bar. So it's really we're sort of so I think. The kit's measurements essentially are 10 arc minutes and less, I'd say. So it's, it's a few megaparsecs and less. I was uh, intrigued by your analysis of kids on the uh, possible or not possible tension with Planck on sigma 8 uh, over square root of omega, um, because you showed that there might be tension from the uh, from the weak lensing analysis, but then when you showed the clustering analysis, there was almost no tension. So would that mean that the, if you believe the weak lensing, does that mean that there is a bias that we don't understand in the galaxy distribution? Statist these are independent measurements. So basically that's what I meant to say, like two sigma, like it can be statistical and that's, there's hints that a lot of this seems to be, like things move up and down sort of within their error bars. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the only way out is like we should not be looking at the same data over and over again, right? It, it's not going to change that much. Um, so it's really more data that is the, the solution. Because with the clustering, it seemed like there was only one sigma tension with uh, yeah, with Yeah, so exactly, applied. right? And that's what you expect. You just add something independently. So in a way, that, that is encouraging, I'd say, because if, if it would just keep moving the other way, uh, and, and yeah, so that sense also the tension, the word tension is just not a good one, right? There's, but from a motivation point of view, it's good, right? Because if you smack on, you don't expect to change anything. So now it at least there's something to investigate. So it's a but does our uncertainty on bi galaxy bias affect the clustering uh, result? Ah, so that's, that is what is solved here. So that's where the lensing, the galaxy lensing comes in. So it's a joint analysis. And, and that's sort of interesting because this is just two bins because you, ha you, you solve for the bias in each of the bins. So you could, in principle, slice things finer, but then you st every slice you get a bias parameter and it turns out the trade-off is, well, we haven't really explored it, so this was just the first bit. So it might improve still a little bit, but, but it's more or less, yeah, but we solve for bias. Uh, well, can you tell us by how much uh, chi-square uh, has been improved by uh, dealing properly with the boundary conditions uh, and the covariance matrix and so on? Uh, For, and the number of degrees of freedom, of course. Yeah, so now I have to remember. So I think it, it dropped, I, I forget, it's roughly, because I think both for DES and, and KITS, it, the paper is online, so you can look it up, but I think it dropped from something like 180 to, say, 120 for 100. 11 or so degrees of freedom. So the new chi-square, the reduced chi-square of both surveys is, is sort of one-ish. The only thing that bothers us is that they agree really, really well with it, too well with each other, but that's, that's what it is. Um, but so that I think is quite, and I think that's both, because we had noticed also that Des had this poor chi-square and we had this. And we too. <laughs> I noticed you had a bad chi-square. Yeah, well. <laughs> But you can't solve your survey geometry so much. <laughs> yeah, but I think that every, they, there's all these little things, and they all, and, that, and that's why with two sigma, right, that, that's, it's interesting to investigate, right, because it's sufficiently unlikely, but there's such a long list of little things that, um, that need to be looked into, and, and that's what we're doing now. And we had hoped to finish this and then as we look, we find new things, unfortunately. Um, but we're starting to exhaust our list of things to, uh, to look into. For now, at least. The list for Euclid is growing. So, one more questions? No? So, but let's thank you again. Thanks.